My story is short, but the time it covers involves several long years. I can't exactly tell you just how desperate I am to find peace over my experience. Finding somebody that will listen without judgment has been a tremendous struggle and no small part of my frustration. The other part is knowing the sort of evils that run free and the things they do to innocent people that just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. I utterly hate confined spaces, and I think that's one of the reasons my older cousin took every chance she could get to get me into a cave with her. It was always a cave, or a closet, or a tunnel, or some small space that we weren't really supposed to be in. She loved to go exploring, and she loved to scare me to death in the process. She was like that as a child, and she stayed that way as she grew older. One day, she finally picked the worst possible place to explore, and she just had to get me involved. She said that she saw a shadow enter a cave in the deserts of New Mexico. We're natives to New Mexico, so the desert doesn't really faze me as much as caverns do. Most of the time, I could hold my breath and explore with her for just a few moments, but that eerie little story was an automatic no for me. Telling her no only made her try harder to persuade me. I don't know how she did it, but she sold me on going into that cave for five whole minutes. She said I could set the alarm on my phone and if it would help. However, I foolishly agreed. The cave entrance was wide and tall, as was the first chamber we found ourselves in. It was more spacious than I thought, and this lulled me into a false sense of security. A natural tunnel led on, and we went, and I agreed to go, feeling more calm than I should have. We both lit up the flashlights on our phones, and I instantly regretted it. There were skins stretched on the tunnel walls, and symbols painted onto them in some sort of chalky red substance. There was no airflow, but I definitely remember seeing the slightest movement in those same skins, as if by some diabolical means there was still some life in them. They didn't just sway, they were twitching and jerking. I pointed this out to my cousin, but she wouldn't even look. She was far too busy worrying about where the tunnel went next. I was beginning to panic well before the five minutes were up. The cavern felt inhabited by something wrong, and if the first tunnel had evil looking skin that still moved, the rest of the cavern couldn't have anything good. She got too far ahead of me, and I lost her. She traveled well beyond my phone's light. She yelled at me to pick up the pace, but I couldn't. Fear held me back like a lanyard. Suddenly, she was running towards me, but two very large gray hands with long and dirty nails closed around her face from behind her. One of the fingernails dug into her eyes, and she screamed as she dragged backwards. That pushed me over the edge. Everything that happened after that felt like a bad movie that I was watching from back of the theater. One of my legs wanted to run after her. One wanted to run to the cave entrance. It was complete mental agony that transcends anything I have ever felt before. I phoned the police and directed them to the remote location of this cavern. They didn't find any of the things I have described to them, not the twitching skins on the walls or anything, and they certainly found no trace of my cousin. 
I've since tortured myself by driving out to the location of the cavern and just standing nearby. If you've never experienced tragedy up close and personal like that before, then there's no point in trying to explain. It's like the way firefighters and soldiers will stand next to Ground Zero of the Twin Towers, even to this very day. It took me three years, but I finally saw something after all my pilgrimages to that cave. It was near sunset one evening when I saw a shape going towards the cavern at a fast clip. It looked every bit like my cousin. The resemblance struck me so hard that I forgot how to be afraid and I chased after her in a state that felt somewhat like sleepwalking. I called out to her as I ran for all I was worth to catch her before she went inside. She stopped just long enough to look straight at me and then disappear inside. It was her. It looked just like her. The eyes were bigger and darker than I remembered, but I didn't care. I had found her. It had to be her. I gave in to my foolishness again and bounded after her into the darkness of this cavern. My phone lit the way, and I yelled for all I was worth. There were more skins than there had been three years prior. There were some that looked like hooded cloaks. I discovered to my horror that they were indeed human. The hoods were faces. They writhed and twitched in my presence. One of them, I swear, the empty face lifted and looked at me. Even though there were no eyes and no solid support, I recognized it right away. It was my cousin's skin. The mouth stretched and flexed and gaped, and a horrible wail sounded far off, as if her voice were coming from somewhere deep in the cave. I reported all this too. You can guess how they reacted, judging by how crazy and insane my story sounds. At the time, I was committed to an institution. The irony was that I needed the help after what I had seen. I can't talk about that experience with just anybody. There's too many people watching me to see if I might need to go back in for treatment. But the encounter is eating me alive, and I don't know why my cousin's skin is hanging on a cavern wall, and why it can scream. I don't know who is walking around with her appearance, and I don't know how long I could stay sane with the knowledge that something awful can happen to any person who ventures around here. My younger brother was really big on illegal hunting. He said that it was more fun when it was something you weren't supposed to be doing. Something about having something to hunt while watching out for being hunted by the law. Either way, he was a man prone to taking self-destructive chances. I went with him as an extra set of eyes. I'm sorry, but you just look out for your little bro. It's just the way it is. Plus, I didn't want him to pick a fight with any animal that's too big for him. He really was the stupid type. You know, the kind that would hit a bear with a stick just for the thrill of being chased by it. I found out the hard way that you really can't save a man from his stupidity if he doesn't want to be saved. And I've paid with having to live with the memory of what happened. In a strange way, I resent my brother for having no such curse. We were in a West Virginia timber that was as wild as you can get without it being too swampy. Life of all kinds was everywhere you looked. Of course, my stupid brother was there to shoot something. He wised up a little bit and took up bow hunting, something that requires far more skill than his dumb face could do. After telling him 500 times plus 
that loud noises draw the heat. He must have finally listened. He spotted an elk that he swore he couldn't do without. Even I had to admit that it was a very impressive animal. At the time, there wasn't a pass on hunting elk. The state was trying to build up their numbers. But this elk was a real looker. And I swear, the thing was looking directly into my brother's eyes. He thought so too. And there was no backing down for him. My brother threw all caution and stealth to the wind, sprinted after the elk with bow in hand. The animal was very peculiar about my brother. It didn't run. It trotted away, but it made no effort to lose my brother. My brother moved faster than I thought he could ever move, so I had some catching up to do. He had gotten way ahead of me, and I wasn't a young man, not even then. I had to navigate a very steep hillside, full of young trees and saplings, which took me quite a while. My brother got through it like it was his element, which is why I was that much more surprised to see my brother standing at the top of a hill where it opened up into a flat, even glade, where one large tree dominated the center of the opening. I've seen some strange trees in those parts, but this one was like something from another world. The bark was black as tar, and it was bristling with spines long enough to be spears. When I caught up with my brother, he was standing in front of it, looking up into its wicked branches, and I noticed he wasn't holding his bow, and I was going to ask him what he did with it, when I noticed that one large spine impaled my brother to the mouth and erupted from the back of his skull. Somewhere in the fog of shock, I stumbled back just in time for a hunter's arrow to miss me by inches and strike a nearby tree. It was one of my brother's arrows. The bow was in the hands of something that had the elk's head, but everything from the neck down looked entirely human, at least mostly human. The exposed skin was a little too gray with hair and looked a little coarse, even from the distance that I was. I tried to reconcile what I was seeing with the earlier sight of an actual elk running on four hoofed legs. Now, there was this actor in a skin suit, and he really did wear a cape of skin. It was like a quilt of patchwork flesh. I think there was more than one animal in that cape too. But the arms and legs didn't quite look right to me. Or maybe the intensity of the moment distorted what I remember. I don't know. Either way, my brother died by his own weapon. Shot by something that went from four legs to two in the blink of an eye. I don't know how that works, and you couldn't pay me enough to go back into that wild wood to find out. I learned that day, there are just some things that are meant to be left alone if you know what's good for you. In the meantime, I'm still deep in the process of mourning. Me and my brothers were deep in rural Nevada and we were photographing everything. When I say we, I mean I. I was the shutterbug. That was back before digital was accessible. I lived for the experience of dropping my film off at Walmart and picking it up a few hours later. We were on the bus to our destination and it had slowed so we could get a look at the open spaces around us. I saw something that couldn't have been 100% natural. It was a wolf, or a coyote, but appeared to have ruby red eyes, and what I swear had been short antlers of some kind. I didn't ask anybody else if they were seeing the same thing. I was too afraid that it would vanish if I looked away. 
This is usually the point where something goes wrong with the camera, but mine worked just fine. The animal even looked right at me as I fired off 15 shots. My last few shots coincided with the thing changing shape right in front of me and going from four legs to two. Suddenly, I felt like I held a million dollars in my camera. If those shots turn out good, I might be able to supply the world's first concrete evidence of something paranormal. However, the developed pictures came back and revealed nothing. The strange thing didn't even show up on film. Everything that had been around it was shown in crisp and sharp detail. Some of my best camera work, actually. Each one looked like well-composed nature shots, but the being, the subject in the photos were missing entirely, as if they were 100% transparent and were gone like they had never been there. I'm not quite sure how to explain it either. One of the most terrifying things that I've ever experienced happened just a few months ago. It is also something that I was never able to fully explain. I got a call from my mother to say that my grandma was feeling poorly and I could run to the store to get her a few things and then drop them over. My mother was out of town for a couple of days and so I didn't really mind helping out. I headed straight to the deli and picked up the bits my mom had said to get and a couple of treats for my grandma some of her favorite candy, and a couple of trashy magazines that she really liked reading. It didn't take too long, despite being fairly busy, and soon, I was heading out of the parking lot. It was this one-way system where you'd have to loop past the store to exit and get back onto the road. As I was driving past, I had to do a double take because standing in front of the store, holding a bag of groceries, was Grandma, wearing her favorite purple leisure suit, and she smiled right at me. Now, the parking lot was backed up, so I couldn't slow down or block the road. I had no choice but to keep going. Although, I thought it was very odd that she was at the store when my mother had asked me to go. At that point, I wasn't worried, nor scared, just confused, I guess. I drive fairly quickly, and I was soon at her house. Her car was parked by the garage, which, again, I thought was kind of strange. She drives at the speed of an old lady. How on earth did she beat me back? My mom had always made sure that my sister and I had the key to their house and this one, just in case we ever needed to get in. So, I unlocked the door now and called out. Nothing. I let myself in and dropped the keys and groceries on the table. Then, I heard a groan from upstairs. Is that you? My grandmother asked. I hurried up there to see her, and there, lying on the bed, in her purple leisure suit, was my grandmother, with one ankle raised up and the size of a Christmas ham. Turns out, she twisted it that morning, which was why she called my mother. She could only just hobble to the bathroom, let alone anything else. There was no way in hell she'd been at the grocery store. So I made her some tea and sat with her for a bit, listening to all the gossip from the neighborhood. I noticed that she had looked real tired too. I asked her if she had been sleeping okay. It couldn't have been from the ankle pain, since that had just happened. She told me that not too well. Now I was feeling even more confused. See, my grandmother loves animals, but doesn't have any pets since they are a lot of commitment. And since my grandfather passed, she likes to be able to just up and visit family without having to worry too much 
on who's going to feed her cats. The dog that keeps coming into the yard, she kept talking about. Night after night it comes. I have no idea where it's from, she said, as she has never seen it around. She paused for another moment, trying to decide whether to carry on. I inquired her more and asked her what is it. She told me that this is going to sound silly, but last night she gave it a treat and she had a funny feeling about it. This thing came right up close to her and was a whole lot bigger than any other dog she'd ever seen and then that she remembers distinctly that very moment that she had seen this thing's face and it was very human-like and had very big yellow eyes. This wasn't a laughing matter, and she seemed genuinely frightened by the entire experience. So, for that, I'm not exactly sure. Although I never mentioned to her seeing her doppelganger at the store, from what she had just recounted, I had a nasty suspicion that she had encountered some sort of skinwalker or shapeshifter who had copied her image. Thankfully, she had never saw that dog again, and both her ankle and general health had recovered after a few days of rest. Why this just happened, I have no idea, but I really have no doubt about what it was. If you're curious, my grandmother doesn't exactly live in town. She doesn't really have much neighbors either. Her backyard is full of rolling pastures filled with thick timber so she gets all sorts of wild animals. In fact, many times, she's told me that that's more than enough than having her own pet. A few years ago, a buddy of mine suggested we go on a road trip. It was the end of summer before we headed back for our final years of college, and she wanted to do something fun and spontaneous. So, we threw some clothes in the bag and off we went. We drove for a few miles with no real clue where we headed or even what we might do when we get there. But it didn't matter. This was freedom and a spur of the moment thing that we'd likely never get the chance again once we were headed off to law and medical school. After driving for around 12 hours straight, we found a motel and crashed for the night. Then, woke up and did it again. By this point, we were headed towards Nevada. We were having great fun. Wind in our hair, tunes on the radio. And as it began to get late again, we looked out for somewhere to stay the night. Although we were mainly sticking to the highways, even some of the main routes now were kind of lonely, and we often didn't see another car for miles. We were also careful on the quieter roads to be on the lookout for any wildlife that might wander into the highway. The last thing we wanted was to run over a deer or a coyote. Not only would it likely damage the car, and make a hell of a mess when we were in the middle of nowhere. We were both animal lovers, and the thought of hurting something was abhorrent. So when I first saw the coyote or wolf, I wasn't sure which at first as it was pretty dark. I was sure to mention it to Callie, who was driving at that point, to be aware of it, and that was all. It seemed to follow us along the road for a bit, as if playing a sick game of chase, but I did think it was kind of cute. I wasn't sure how it was keeping pace, but we weren't going too fast. I suggested that it might have a lot of stamina. Callie began to feel slightly ill and at ease, so she put her foot on the gas to speed up ever so slightly. She was more inclined to acknowledge, whether it was a wolf, coyote, or some kind of wild rabbit dog. It was a predator, and it was best if we lost it. 
but we didn't. Callie sped up, and it did too. What the hell? she had asked, ramming her foot onto the gas pedal and taking the speedometer up to 70 miles an hour. And it kept the pace, as if we were at a calm walking speed. We were freaking out. There was no way this animal should be able to do this. It was near impossible. I watched the speedometer climb up to 90 and even up to 100 miles an hour, and Callie looking as if she was losing control. And when I dared to glance out the window, it was still there, its face turned towards us. It was huge, much bigger than what I would presume your average canine desert beast would average, and it had bright yellow eyes. They glowed like orbs. I held in a scream, and to this day, I don't know how I managed. I just knew at this speed, I couldn't startle Callie, or we'd wind up in a ditch. Then, all of a sudden, it was gone. She brought the car back down to around 70, and maintained that all the way to the stretch of lights and buildings that also included a Motel 6. We were both absolutely terrified, and it took us some time to be brave enough to leave the car and race over to the motel. Sensing our distress, the guy behind the check-in desk asked if we were okay. Did we need any help? When we told him what had happened, he just nodded and suggested that we find a different route home. Looking at each other, we knew there was no way in hell we'd ever drive that stretch of highway again. Back in high school, I had a really good friend who lived on the res. His folks owned a farm out there, and sometimes I would stay over and help out with chores. I really liked animals and had wondered about maybe becoming a veterinarian someday. Since the property was surrounded by thick woodland and their cattle was their livelihood, they had plenty of fencing and traps laid out for any would-be predators, such as coyotes or wolves, something that might try and attack and hurt the herd. One of the neighbors had to have been on the lookout for some sort of mangy looking coyote who was obviously getting braver the hungrier got as it had been seen straying closer to the properties. I kind of felt a little sorry for it, not liking to think that any creature should be starving, even one that was likely to cause devastation if it was to get into the field. There was also the matter that several of the cows with calf, which made them slower as they were huge, therefore easier prey, and the fact that the family would be losing two creatures. So, all this meant they were being extra vigilant and on hyper alert for any evidence that the coyote was planning an attack. Which leads me to the reason that my friend and I were in the field that evening, complete with shotguns, hiding and waiting for the beast to appear. We planned to stay out there for a few hours, probably until we got too cold and earned some brownie points from his mom. It was just after midnight, getting close to when we would call it a day, when we heard a noise. George's dad had installed security lights, and although it was not exactly lit up like Friday night on a football field, it still gave us an advantage. So, when we saw what we thought was a coyote, George got his trigger finger ready on the shotgun. Move back, he whispered to me, as he aimed at this thing. He fired one shot. The cows started mooing and shuffling about as we craned our necks to see if we'd hit the thing. And that's when to our horror, this thing stood up on two legs, just like a freaking person, and ran off. Although it was much taller than a coyote, which would normally stand on two legs, way, way taller than any dog would ever be able to be. 
we could see from the illumination from the security lights that this thing was covered in reddish hair and quick as a flash, it ran. George, seemingly unturned by this development, ran to the perimeter and fired off several more shots. I have no idea if he hit anything. He came back to me then said we needed to get inside very fast. Waking up his parents, he asked if I wouldn't mind waiting in the kitchen for a moment whilst he talked to them. I wasn't sure what to think. Had I really just seen a huge red coyote, person thing, standing on two feet and then disappearing at the speed of light? When George came back into the kitchen, he looked frightened. He told me that he wasn't allowed to fill me in on much of it because it was against tribal lore to share such things with outsiders, no matter how close I was to him and the family. I understood, as his traditions are sacred. All he was able to say was that I wasn't to come back until the place was safe. The creature we had seen was far more powerful and evil than I could ever imagine. I didn't ask any more, but when I got home, you bet I went and searched online. I looked and looked, and the only thing I could find was that of a skinwalker. Is this exactly what we encountered, or could we have encountered something more demonic? First off, I'm not a professional, and not exactly sure if these are skinwalkers. It was 2019, November I believe. I went hunting with my family, and we own a huge farm. I would love to share where, but have been stalked before, and that's still a fear of mine. Anyway, we set out around 5 in the morning, but that's not important. Later that day, finally, my cousin had shot one, a medium-sized buck, a four-pointer. It was growing dark as we got the buck into the garage to prepare. Anyway, as we were skinning the deer, the forest grew eerily silent. The only sound was light footsteps in the forest and coyotes howling off in the distance. By the time we finished skinning the deer, it was now pitch black. Just as we were about to leave the garage and go eat dinner, the door got stuck. My uncle was relatively mad and fought with it. He couldn't get the garage door all the way closed, but gave up. So we go eat, and then off to bed. I couldn't sleep. Something kept me up. I had the best bed, warm temperatures, everything was perfect, but I just couldn't sleep. My window was opened, and I was hearing crunches outside. Now keep in mind, this is about one in the morning. I tossed and turned, but nothing. Then the tapping and scratching started on my window screen. I was horrified. I grabbed my phone and shined the flashlight over to the screen. What I saw horrified me. It was the deer, the deer we had just skinned earlier. Not I forgot to mention, but this deer had a huge dent in its skull. We had no idea why, but on this imposter, the same dent was in the same place. I was slightly alarmed at the sight, and then I remembered. My window is six feet off the ground. I sat there, frozen in fear, and the thing let out a low growl and stared at me. I tried to ignore it, but fear overwhelmed me, and I then fainted. I woke up in the morning and ran over to the garage. The skin was gone. The only thing left was a pool of blood. The deer was still hanging up fine. I ran over to my window, and there were prints. Not deer prints. They looked like footprints, mixed with a deer hoof, and some type of deep indentation 
That could have been a claw mark. I grew up going to my non-blood related, very close family's friend, uncle's cabin, which was on a lake connecting to many other lakes, which goes into a well-known chain of lakes in that region. Anyway, this was when I was about nine years old, and I had an extreme fear of being anywhere without my mother, since she was the only one around to take care of me and my siblings. This is because my dad had always been a heavy drinker and on deployment, but luckily not abusive. So, because of this, I was sleeping in the same bed as my mom on the ground floor of the old early 19th century cabin. It was raining outside, and around 1 a.m., I could not fall asleep for some reason. The window on the left of the bed was open with a screen on, and my mother was fast asleep. I looked out the window to look at all the trees outside when I heard it. It sounded like the noise of a cliché monster would make, except this was booming across the entire lake outside the cabin, and since I'd been looking at the trees, I could see the trunks and branches vibrating from the roar that I had heard. Since it was so loud, I had no idea which way it came from, but I knew that I had heard it when it was only me and my uncle and older brother. This time, I was 12. I told my uncle all about it, and he started freaking out. He had told me that the Native American artifacts and items had been constantly found around that area since long before it became a settled town. Ever since then, I've been able to notice strange things in the surrounding woods and lakes especially while kayak fishing on my own during the dusk. Just small things, like an animal staring at me through the edge of the woods for at least 30 minutes at a time and following me when I got to a new spot. On one occasion, I was going swimming out in the middle of the lake. I'd gotten there by my uncle's jet ski, so from far away, it would be semi-hard to spot me. I had been swimming around for 25 minutes when I noticed a man's head bobbing up and down in the water, all while staring at me. He had not been there before, and I hadn't or heard him seen him swim out there. Keep in mind, this is about a half mile from the nearest shore. Needless to say, I got the hell home after watching him for just a couple of minutes, just sitting there. My last experience that I will share was again when I was around 12. I was wakeboarding, which by the way is my favorite water sport. It was a gloomy day, so that could have very well contributed to this feeling. But every time I let go of the rope and waited for my uncle to turn around and come get me in that boat, I got the most strong feeling of being watched, more than I ever have in my entire life. I felt it all around me, from the trees, the murky black ice like water surrounding me, and the dark looming sky. I felt like I was going to be swallowed by the eeriness, to the point that I almost began vomiting. The dark water was so cold, I couldn't even feel my legs. When I got back on the boat, I was shivering, and my uncle had thought the water was really cold, so he stuck his foot in. The water was warm, almost too warm to swim in. I felt the water, and it was warm, which was very different from the water I felt before. The clouds began to clear, and the forest around me began to look normal and warm. I don't usually go swimming anymore or go out alone on the lake to fish by myself. So, long story short, 
my girlfriend and I were swapping scary stories, and she told me about skinwalkers, which I'd never heard of before. When she told me what they were, and showed me a few videos, I immediately thought of an experience that I had right about eight years ago when I was just 15 and my brother was 12. We grew up in rural northwestern Missouri, a little over an hour and a half north of Kansas City. We had two other houses on our road, both about a mile away, but they were both quiet elderly couples who I've never seen out past dark. All of the houses on our road, mine included, were surrounded by corn and wheat fields and trees on all sides. One night, I was lying in bed, trying to fall asleep, when I heard the most awful, blood-curdling scream outside my window. It sounded like a woman being brutally murdered in the road. Her scream was so garbled and desperate. I'm 5'3", and was a 15-year-old girl. So, obviously, I ran to my parents' room to tell my dad she needed help. They said they hadn't heard anything outside, which blew my mind, because it was so loud that it made my very blood run cold. Not five seconds later, my brother came running in, saying he was in his room and heard a woman screaming for help outside. At this point, my dad started to get concerned and ran outside. But there was nobody else around. I could usually see headlights through my bedroom window, so we were pretty sure no cars had gone by. There was no way she could have disappeared so quickly, especially judging by her screams. My mom, dad, and little sister, who was eight years old at the time, never heard a sound but my brother and I still occasionally talk about it to this day, just because it was so weird and upsetting. My mom swears it was an owl, but I had heard screeching owls a handful of times while living there, and it was most definitely not an owl. I've been told that mountain lions sometimes make a noise like a woman's scream, but they're incredibly rare in that part of Missouri. Even growing up in the country, with a forest behind my house. I had only seen a mountain lion once in the entire 10 years I lived there. My mom has seen one, once, also in that same time frame, but we've never heard them. So, I guess it could have been a mountain lion, but I still don't think that's what I heard. Just a woman's scream that was way too loud and had something a little off about it. I appreciate any answers anybody might be able to give me. It was a crazy experience, and now that I look back on it, it's spooky, and it rendered me unable to sleep. I was camping in a ravine in Nevada on my own spiritual journey. I wanted to be someplace isolated where I would be difficult to approach, and your average stroller wouldn't just happen upon me. I had two very healthy servings of both LSD and peyote, so I meant to cross over to the other side without any interference. I was definitely safe from people, but I hadn't factored in the presence of some other things. The stars were starting to peek out, and I had not heard any cars or people or anything for well over an hour so I decided that it would be safe to begin my vision quest. The fire I built began to dance in strange rhythms and shapes under the influence of psychedelics. I felt joyful at the way things were unfolding, and I intended to fully embrace whatever came. I might have felt differently if I had any clue what would truly take place. Some of the stars began to dance in time with the fire, I felt myself caught up in the rhythm that the universe had adopted. However, it had taken me a moment too long to notice a few stars that weren't doing anything. They were fixed and steadfast, somehow anchored, even though the world as I knew it 
had begun to dance in one lively and singular choreographed dance. I couldn't bring my attention away from those stars that would not move. Perhaps they could tell me that I was staring at them because they began to bob slightly. It took me a second to realize that they were bobbing because they were approaching. They weren't stars at all. They were eyes. Eyes that were getting closer. Eyes that weren't looking at anything except me. With this realization came my awareness of several other sets of eyes all around me. None of 10 such sets of eyes formed a perimeter and they brought with them something that chilled me to the bone when I heard it. A form of laughter that wasn't human nor animal. They got just close enough for the rays of my fire to touch them and they were revealed to be what appeared to be deer. Somehow, even under the influence, I can tell that that's not what they were. I feel like the acid gave me a much more deeper spiritual insight to the true beings that stood before me. They must have had a clue that I were onto them, because all at once, the ones that I could see stood up on their hind legs and began banging their front hooves together. It wasn't haphazard-like, rather it was like ritualistic drumming. Even the chaos of the laughter began to adopt the rhythm of the clapping hooves. The rhythm was in contrast, and really in disharmony. With the initial rhythm that was established by the fire and the stars above, the act of the creature standing on their hind legs, clapping, was scary enough. They decided to take it a step further, and began smiling at me. When I say smiling, I mean their lips peeled back as far as they possibly could. Some of them looked like they were going to cover up their eyes with their top lips, pulling back so far to reveal teeth that did not belong anywhere on a deer. Nasal cavities that were not part of the skull structure of deer, just barely revealing between the lips and the eyes that had two small pupils and large whites to have belonged to deer, as if the skin were hiding something like true nature. I then passed out, lost all consciousness. When I woke up again, the fire was burnt out, and a chill had stolen into my bones that would not go away. Whatever those things were, they didn't take any money, nor rob me of anything. Well, they didn't take any physical thing of value, but stole something from inside of me. I also think they placed something in me. Something like a spiritual cancer, because I feel a little more empty every day. Smiling and thinking positively has become an increasingly difficult chore. Something is eating me up inside, leaving a spiritual vacuum. Anybody else has experienced something similar, please reach out to me. I honestly feel that having taken those psychedelics opened my spirit and mind up to seeing these beings. Had I not been on anything, I don't know if I would have had the contact that I did. It's like taking those drugs allowed me to be in their realm, so to speak, and they knew it, which is why I think they came to harm me, at least not physically. I have a nighttime ritual that I perform every single evening. I'm not exaggerating, literally every single evening. If I miss, I'm afraid to think of what will happen to everyone in the nearby town, let alone to me. It's amazing how connected everything is. I've discovered the hard way that no man is an island. When people say that something doesn't matter or that a person doesn't matter, they have no idea how wrong they are. Everything affects everything. Not everything may affect other things to the same degree, but there's no such thing as zero connection. I sat on the back porch, same as usual. I grip my dad's shotgun. I double, sometimes triple check the shells are in place and the gun isn't half cocked. I heard the whistling approach the porch. I don't look. As many times as I've done this, I still can't look, ever. It was the shape of my father approaching the porch. He had his hands in his overalls, 
and he was slightly waddling side to side. He stopped just shy of the porch and asked me if he could sit next to me for a little bit and chit chat. I told him that he needed to go back where he came from. He shrugged his shoulders and turned around and started to go back, retracing his steps. He stopped just long enough to look over his shoulder at me and asked me if I'm sure. I told him that I am and that I won't hesitate to shoot him if he did not keep going. He shrugged again and said all right, and then kept going. I waited until I could see him become a speck on the horizon next to all the other specks that are the gravestones in the family cemetery. I can't let him have his way because if he were to take me, then he would start working on the people that know me. He would look like me. He would talk his way into their graces. Then he would take them and start working on the people that would know them and so forth. It's not easy for two simple reasons. One, I really, really miss my dad. He passed away some odd years ago, and I haven't been the same since. Second, the simple fact that the thing is able to assume my dad's appearance means that it has taken his skin. The question will bug me and haunt me as to how did it take his skin so that it could take his shape I was flying down the highway recently and a stretch of desert near California, enjoying every bit of life. I was in a Jeep that was brand new, had the radio blaring and having the time of my life. Nothing but me and the open road and all the emptiness around. At least I thought I was alone. It took me a moment to notice that there was some sort of dog running beside my vehicle doing its best to keep up. It could have been a Great Dane because it was doing an impressive job of keeping good pace. I have a soft spot for animals, so I slowed down to take a look at him and see if he was playing or if he was truly desperate. I've seen abandoned animals approach strangers for help, and I'm especially fond of dogs. And once the dog was beside my vehicle, it looked at me, and there was something about it that wasn't quite right. Something about the sharpness of its cheekbones, or the way its skin seemed to be vacuum-packed in its head. I don't know. There was also a light in its eyes that left me feeling unsettled. I decided that this dog was too strange and had too much energy to be astray. So my conscience allowed me to speed up and leave it behind. Except when I sped up, I couldn't leave it behind. I was pushing near 90 and this thing was matching my speed, no problems. I saw it back a wave of anxiety as I looked at the dog, trying to figure it out. And it looked at me, making full eye contact. And you know what? It smiled. As comical as that sounds, it was by far the most disturbing thing I had ever seen. I tried to push my vehicle to go faster as I did the dog begin to transform his legs appearing to get longer, and his speed got faster. It started to look like some kind of demonic deer or elk. It was when I was on the brink of a panic attack that it broke off its pursuit. I breathed a huge sigh of relief, one second too soon, because a car came at me from a slight hill, and it's a miracle we didn't collide with each other head on. I'm convinced that an accident like that was the creature's goal. What on earth was I dealing with out there? I'm one of those lazy hunters that likes to hunt with a trail cam. I'm sorry, but I don't feel like sitting outside all day for something that isn't there. I'm a family man, which means that I have other things to spend my precious time on. I hear all kinds of stories about people that lost their families because they spent too much time hunting. So, with my large network of cameras, I was able to make sure that there was actually something to hunt before I went out, gun in hand. In fact, I can remember it clearly. It was one Sunday afternoon that the camera went off at the perfect timing. Our jerky and meat was dwindling, 
and needed replenished desperately. One of the cameras on the eastern end of our property line went off, and there in profile was the perfect, most thick buck I'd ever seen in my life. He looked good, and he looked good enough to eat. Easily a five-pointer from what it appeared. He looked like he would be feeding us for a long time, if I could just get him down. I think he was rutting, because I know I've seen doe in the area, and it is that time of year. So, I know better than to just rush out. I had to wait to see if he would trip another camera and give me any kind of idea where he was bedding down or the area he was moving in. Camera number three went off about 20 minutes later, which told me that he was heading straight into the heart of my property, which is where a lot of the doe congregated. Absolutely perfect. I showed my wife what was up and told her that I would go get us our food for the next month. Although a buck that big could be feeding us all winter plus. It was beautiful weather for doing what I was doing. The whole thing had my spirits riding pretty high. Once I got my bearings, I found its tracks and I began to close in slowly. My phone started vibrating in my pocket and feeling annoyed, I knew it was my wife. I had told her not to bother me unless it was absolutely necessary to do so and I know that I did not leave anything for her to do so she wouldn't have to bother me. I couldn't help but be confused for a few moments when I checked my messages. She was telling me that I might not want to take down this particular animal. It had tripped off several more of the cameras and in each picture it looked more weird. It was like a slow progression of it standing on its hind legs and the skin around its face peeling off. Its mouth peeling back like it was beginning to smile, but then it kept peeling as its skin wore a hood and the bone underneath was some disguised monster. I agree with my wife and I began to retreat, believing her. But the animal, which I had not seen up to that point, began following me. Its footsteps matched mine, and it wasn't getting any more distant. That's when I felt immediate danger. I knew this was something else, and not a buck. My heartbeat picked up, and in my attempt to be quiet, I was nervous, and it made me step on several dry twigs, which gave me away completely. But, unlike most animals that would flee from such sounds, it actually picked up its pace toward me. I gave in and bolted in a panic, not knowing what I was dealing with. At one point, right before I made it to the house, I knew that if I turned around, I would see it only feet behind me. And I also knew that I wouldn't want to see it because then I might be completely frozen in fear. I made it inside safely, but somehow, more shaken up than I'd ever been in my life. I can recall even when my wife was describing this to me, the shaking in her voice and tone disturbed me deeply, which is why I believed her. Look, I still love to hunt, but I have no idea what the hell kind of buck was that, or if it was even a buck at all. So, I'm wanting to reach out to you. What the hell did I see on my property, and what was I dealing with? I can also supply pictures if need be. Thank you for your time. I had been bow hunting with one of my friends from school. The hill country of Texas was particularly in our backyards, so there was no reason why we couldn't be out there spending so much time together. It was the most fortunate stroke of luck that both of us had as parents that wanted to see us have fun or they wanted us out of the house. Either way, my technique was a little rusty, and my friend showed me a few things before we began moving on to living and moving targets. I was able to bring down two small hares and a coyote before. That is, until I came across the most beautiful elk I'd ever seen in my life. My friend was just awestruck, but he seemed to be more afraid than anything else. It was strange, because I had never seen him act like that before. 
He seemed to be gathering himself to encourage me not to take this particular target, but I was too excited to listen. I knocked my arrow, and I took him, and I shot. And I watched as the bolt sailed straight for the heart of this creature. You can imagine my shock and dismay when an arrow struck me in the back. And no, it was not my friend. We only had one bow between us two. My friend cried out. The elk that I had shot the arrow at looked at me straight in the eye, and it grinned. I don't know what an elk's teeth are supposed to look like, but I know that they did not look like that. Those teeth seemed far too human. I was rushed to the hospital and lost consciousness many times due to blood loss. My friend is being held responsible for what was done, even though both of us explained that I was holding the bow. Nobody was open to the possibility that the arrow I fired had somehow ended up behind me as if by magic. I understand that's a bit of a stretch, but it's much more plausible than the notion of my friend taking the bow and arrow from me, shooting me and then giving it back, all while me holding it. I don't know what else to think. Truth is stranger than fiction, and it's giving me one of those moments of paranoia where I'm pretty sure that the people who hear our story actually believe us, but they know something and they're going to play dumb. Look, me and my friend are sticking by our story, and I will continue to defend him, even if it means doing so in court. We're gonna push this as far as it can go. I used to be part of the Border Patrol in Arizona. It's every bit the horrible, heart-wrenching, dehumanizing work that you've heard about in the news. Except something that I experienced recently took it a step further. It's nearly impossible to keep the border 100% patrolled and 100% secure. If you repair one hole, there's another one being dug or cut or blasted while you're in the middle of the job. It's like being on a ship that is full of holes with water rushing in and you decide which ones you're going to plug with your fingers which minute. I was slowly rolling along a section of fence when someone came flying through it on foot. They looked to be completely by themselves, so I took after him. Naturally, he tried to take me in terrain where I would have to get out of my vehicle and chase him on foot. Things like that made the job much more difficult. Not because it's physically demanding or the temperature, but it also tells me how desperate they are to escape from whatever they were fleeing across the border for. It was just as I was getting out of my vehicle that a voice had caught me off guard. It sounded exactly like the voice of my commanding officer. It was the voice of my commanding officer, actually. I snapped to attention and told him as respectfully as possible that I was in the middle of a pursuit. All the while I was having this conversation, I noticed that I couldn't actually see him. That's when it began to stand out as the odd voice that seemed to be coming in the direction that the border crosser had fled. The voice of my commanding officer began ordering me to turn around to get back to work. I cocked my head and kept approaching, informing him respectfully again that I was at work and that I should be allowed to carry out my duties. I cast my flashlight in the direction that the voice is coming from, and there was the border crosser speaking with the voice of my commanding officer. My next instinct was to dash for him and tackle him, but he flashed me a smile that was so disturbing I hesitated, and then his eyes began to emit a glow, and his teeth began to lengthen, and then his neck got longer, and he dropped onto all fours and turned into something like a coyote the smile and eyes remaining nearly the same. I had to take leave of duty after that because my nerves would not allow me to work. It's one thing to meet a creature that you hear about in half-whispered native legends, but it's another to find the one that knows something about you and the people in your life and then exploits that information on contact. Yes, to summarize everything, I wholeheartedly believe in skinwalkers 
now that I'm fairly certain I had my first personal encounter with one. I needed some extra work to help make ends meet, and I picked up some part-time hours helping out on a farm for an older gentleman who lived just inside Arizona. Actually, he was right near the border. He was mostly a cattle rancher, and he was the type that would follow me around to chat while I worked. He didn't seem to mind the fact that when he talked, it did slow me down a bit. He just seemed to be happy to have company and gladly be paying me for it. One day, he got on the topic of something that I thought was lore and legend, something he referred to as skinwalkers. It wasn't completely unfamiliar to me, but I knew that it was supposed to be bad luck to discuss them, something that I'd ever only heard of in passing. Something about how skinwalkers had a way of knowing when somebody was talking about them, and they would show up, invited, supposedly, to take revenge. He then shared some stories regarding people that he felt were affected by skinwalkers. One of them involved the people that owned the ranch before him. I had to be careful or I would stop working just to listen to them because he told such compelling accounts that it almost sounded like he was there for each one of them. He asked me if I had any stories of my own and I didn't have any direct experience with skinwalkers or any such thing, thank goodness. But I did know a few tales connected to people that I knew. And isn't that the way those stories always go? It's never you. It's always somebody that knows you. I mentioned that to him when I thought that's the one reason why I never fully bought into the idea of those things actually existing. Making such a statement seemed to upset him in the slightest because he suddenly went rigid and his smile got stiff. He said that either that was the case or skinwalkers really just don't want to be seen. I shrugged. It caught my attention that he really seemed to believe in them. So I asked him why he didn't have any qualms with openly discussing them. I mean, wasn't he afraid that one would eventually hear him and come after him? He just then stared at me blankly for a couple seconds before saying that he enjoys talking about them because it invokes them onto his ranch at night and he enjoys their company. I wasn't really sure what to say. It kind of shocked me, but I just continued on working. And after that, he walked away, ending the conversation awkwardly. I wasn't really sure what to think about the entire thing, so I just continued to do my paid work. After that, he never really talked to me like he used to. Sure, there would be conversations here and there, but it wasn't full-blown for hours like it was. I don't know what the disagreement, or if there was really any disagreement at all. I don't know, I find the whole thing weird. So what do you think? Do you think he has some sort of relationship to skinwalkers? I mean, I know the thought sounds ridiculous, but... I can't necessarily understand his strange and bizarre behavior, especially now, after that conversation. Something has been happening to me on and off for the last few months. It's really been affecting my sleep, which means it's interfering with my career. And I'm just not sure what to do. Every so often, like once every three or four days, roughly, I hear this voice from outside calling my name. Sometimes I don't wake up at first from that noise. It can be the smell that hits my nostrils, like my dog has brought in something dead. As soon as my nose hair starts to burn, I wake up, and then I hear my name right outside my window. Other times, it isn't the smell but my dog that wakes me. He sleeps with me now, and he'll be growling. This low protective but frightened growl that I have never heard him make before. He is also a husky, and huge, but whatever outside the window had him whining like a pup. The first couple of times I thought I'd been dreaming, then just went back to sleep. Then, I decided to look out the window, 
The reason being that this voice that was calling to me, calling my name, was my mother's voice. So I'm thinking, she's gone out for a smoke, and the door shut, or she must be sleepwalking. Not that I've ever known that to happen, but you grasp for a reasonable explanation. So, I look out of the window, directly after I hear my name. No mom. I quietly tread down the hall to my mother's room. She's in her bed, conked out. No way she could have gotten back around the house that quickly. But it doesn't stop. Something mimicking my mother's voice is calling my name. Nothing else. Just my name over and over for around 10 minutes, then ending abruptly. I try to shout back, tell it to leave me alone. I've looked outside from any trace of what it might be. I have even ran outside once, when I was so tired, I was feeling brave or reckless. But there was nothing there. No trace of somebody standing under my window. No tape recorder playing my name. The sign of an elaborate hoax. I've started drinking just to knock myself out so I can get some sleep before it starts. It doesn't seem to want anything, but it won't leave me alone either. I don't know why it's chosen me or why it mimics my mom. Sometimes, she pulls the third shift and works, and still the voice comes when she isn't even in the house. I did some digging, and there haven't been any deaths reported on the property or nearby land, none that I could find anyway. I'm not an expert on ghosts, but this didn't feel like that. I don't know how much it is true, but I've never felt cold or seen orbs, the kind of stuff that goes along with haunting. What I did find was that the forest on the other side of our land used to be Navajo, and despite there not being any particularly large predators just wandering around the neighborhood, there have been slight sightings over the years of a large bear and a wolf that both supposedly walk on two legs connected to that area. Look, I don't know much about skinwalkers. Quite frankly, even just the concept is terrifying to me. But we have a very diverse population in our town, including ancestors of that original Navajo settlement, individuals that choose not to live on the reservation. After all, just because you're native to a particular tribe doesn't mean you're forced or have to live on the res. There are ones that do venture out, in fact, I know some of them personally. Anyway, who is that that is calling to me? And if so, why? I don't want to acknowledge the S word, but I feel and fear that it just might be. Horses are one of the most sensitive creatures to be able to pick up on any paranormal or supernatural occurrences. I've been out riding a few times when my mare just suddenly abruptly stopped and started bucking and refusing to carry one, and I've just supposed that she has been able to pick up on something that I could not see nor feel. It's always a bit unnerving, but it has never actually frightened me before. That is, until we went on a camping trip outside of Arizona. It seemed like the perfect mini-adventure. I had just come out of a very toxic, draining relationship, and my best friend had been dealing with some grief issues regarding the death of a very close family member. A few days with just our horses and a tent seemed like the perfect way to get out and clear our minds. We put the horses in the trailer, and off we went. It wasn't too much of a drive, and soon we had arrived, and we were off and on our way. We rode for a while, but it was so darn hot, we didn't take the girls too far, and then we found a nice spot, not too far from some shade to set up camp. It's true what they say about being outdoors. It really does make you extra hungry and sleepy, so we called it a night pretty early. I guess it's because we were so overstimulated by our new environment. Heading into our tent, having ensured that the horses were comfortable with food and water. Sometime in the night, I'm not sure when exactly, as my watch had stopped working. 
and we were both awoken by the horses whining and stomping their hooves. I was just about to unzip the tent when my friend grabbed my hand, shaking her head fiercely at me, finger to the mouth in a shh motion. This was the most unusual, as she would have usually always been the first one out to make sure the mares were okay. We had a small battery-powered lamp in the tent, which wasn't exactly giving off much light. So, I made to grab my phone and to turn on the torch when she again shook her head to indicate no. By this point, I was beginning to get a bit confused. I shrugged my shoulders and lifted up my arms in the universal, what on earth is going on, fashion to her. That's when I heard it, scratching on the tent fabric, like something was running its fingers up and down, caressing. I honestly don't know how I did not scream or piss myself. Whatever was out there circled the tent two or three times, using what sounded like a sharp object, which what I can only make out is possibly a claw, or finger, or something, who knows to drag alone. By now the horses were going mad. I thought they might break through their ropes, or hurt themselves, but I was frozen. Then altogether, everything stopped. We waited, staring at each other for I don't even know how long. At some point, I noticed the horses had calmed, and we could hear them breathing and nickering. Finally, she nodded at me, and I slowly undid the tent. The horses appeared fine, shaken by something, but appearing uninjured. You could clearly see a mark on the tent, though, where something had been walking around and scratching on the fabric. Not to try and rip through the tent, but almost some sort of sick, sadistic, hey, I'm here kind of kick. But there was no obvious footprints or tracks leading up to or away. Just dirt. Everything had been kicked up as the thing moved around us. Almost like whoever or whatever it was didn't want any tracks to be left behind. I can truthfully say that I have never been more terrified. We cut our trip short, packed up and got the hell out of there right away with the sun just starting to rise in the sky. I have since heard of other people that have had very similar experiences on that land, that always ride there with their horses. However, I have to ask you, do you think this could have been a skinwalker, or was this just simply a person toying with us? What are your thoughts? I have several buddies who are from Navajo descent and they have all told me at least one story involving something that can only be described as a skinwalker, dare I say. There are certain rules and things within the community that means they can't say too much, so I won't give any specific details as I don't want anything to come back on them. But they are so creepy, you gotta hear it. One buddy told me that he would regularly see his grandmother all over town she would never speak but just stare at him and smile, but not a warm and welcoming hello. This was more of a sinister grin. The most usual place to see her was in one of the stores or walking down by the river, walking along quite happily. Only his grandmother was disabled and hadn't had the use of her legs for years. Most of the time she was bedbound, let alone able to leave the house to go walking around. Another buddy, stated that his dad's farm regularly had injured animals and found out on the land that sheep had been mauled, chickens with their heads torn off. They put up high fencing to try and stop whatever animal. They supposed it was either a wolf or a coyote, but it kept happening. So, one night, they decided to stay up with a loaded shotgun and find out just exactly what was attacking their animals. Just after midnight, they saw what they described to me as a wolf climbing over a high fence with no problems at all. Having scaled the fence with ease of a person rather than an animal, it walked on two legs toward the sheep. To start with, my buddy and his dad were so shocked, they just watched 
as this beast walked nonchalantly over to one of their livestock. But his dad recovered quickly from shock and took a shot at this being. He told me it screamed at them in a very human tone. For a moment, almost flashing between human and wolf. That was the best way he can describe it. It was like some sort of special effect that you might see on a movie. Man, wolf, man, and then back to wolf again as it ran. Apparently, my buddy's dad went to see a medicine man later that day, and they didn't have any further issues. Finally, another friend had an equally scary experience whilst driving around the res. They were heading home from a day teaching in the local high school and had stayed late due to it being football season, so she'd stayed to watch the game. Once she got back onto the res, she stated that she saw a large dog standing by the side of the road. She didn't think too much of it to start with, merely that it likely belonged to somebody who was taking it for a walk. As she drove past it, it started to follow alongside the car. Ah, how cute she thought at first, but it didn't seem to slow. Worried that it would lose its owner, she sped up a little bit, but the dog kept up. Now, starting to worry a bit, she sped up more, but the dog managed to keep pace. She ended up hitting the gas pedal and speeding up to about 60 miles an hour, with the dog still right outside the window when poof, it just suddenly disappeared. There are plenty more weird scary things that have told me, but those are the three most hellish stories, and they've always stuck with me. Anyone who doesn't believe in this stuff should seriously go and spend some time on the res or talking to some of the local natives there. I guarantee you they'll make a believer out of you yet. In fact, I used to be the world's biggest skeptic. Now, not so much. This story is going to sound really cliche and even made up just because of where it happened, but it's real. When I was a kid, we lived in quite a big house in a really nice neighborhood. In fact, there were lots of big houses and even a lake with a beach where we could all go swimming and have cookouts in the summer and a huge golf course where all the dads would hang out together. It was pretty much an amazing privileged childhood. Until the day I was out on the golf course and I saw what I firmly believe to be a skinwalker. It all began with a girl and a dare, as these things often do when you are 13 and full of raging testosterone. We were in our final year of junior high and the girl that I had a crush on since the third grade had finally began to notice me just a bit a group of us would hang out in the summer evenings, our parents trusting us not to do anything dumb and the area safe for them not to be worried. We weren't quite brave enough for 60 seconds of heaven or spin the bottle, so truth or dare seemed the next best thing, and especially if there was some sort of prize related to the dare. And wouldn't you know, when it was my turn, I chose dare and the girl I was into said if I went into the woods next to the golf course for a whole 10 minutes, she would kiss me. So, my mind blown, off I went. There was no question about it. It might have been close to 10 p.m., and our curfew, it might have been really dark in those woods. But hell, I was going to get that kiss. So, there I was, in the trees, watching the hands on my watch movie in the slowest ever possible fashion when I hear a twig snap behind me. Now, yes, I jumped because I was pumped with adrenaline, but I wasn't immediately frightened. I presumed it was some sort of woodland creature coming to see what I was up to since, after all, I was in their domain at nighttime. Come on, I remember thinking, wondering how it could be possible for time to actually be this slow and that was when I felt breath on the back of my neck. Now, that did scare me, as did the noxious aroma that hit my nose, like something had died right in front of me. Rot and stink. 
unlike the time the dog brought a squirrel into the garden, and we didn't find it for days. Now, people say one of two things happen when you are faced with immediate danger. You know, the whole fight or flight thing. But the other thing that can happen is that even though you instinctively know you need to get the hell out of there, you can freeze up, which was what happened to me. I wanted more than anything to fly, but I was rooted to that spot. And then I saw the eyes. Whatever it was, not only smelt like death, but was really tall, as the eyes were much higher than my head, and those eyes were a glowing dull red. That was enough for the flight part to take over. I screamed and screamed and booked it out of there as fast as I could. I ran all the way back to my buddies, who I met about halfway, as they had actually heard my scream and were concerned, and were even more worried when they saw the look of pure, unadulterated terror wearing on my face. There was no way they thought I was messing with them, and even though we knew it would likely end up in us being grounded, they took me home to my parents. They called the police as the first thing they thought of was that there must have been some trespasser, a potential child molester or trafficker, or even a junkie hiding up there. That I had thought I had seen red eyes, but it was just fear. The cops searched all around, but could not find any trace of anything having been there, except for the spot I was there, where the leaves had been trampled and any footprints were visible. They knew I wasn't lying. There are only so many things kids can do to play tricks, and not only were none of us stupid enough to keep a prank going long enough that involves the authorities, but something else happened that nobody will ever be able to explain. Something that proves just how damn frightened I was at the time. I got the nickname DeVille, after Krula DeVille, as I have a pure white streak to the front of my hair. So if anyone ever asks, your hair can turn white from fright. But why am I telling you all this? Well, after the cops came up empty-handed, and the adults at least were pleased that there wasn't some pedo hobo living on the golf course, us kids did a bit more digging. It turns out that alongside a lot of these parts, this land used to belong to the Native American people. And wouldn't you know, Right where the golf course is, where those woods are now, was the main part of that land, where they just so happened to have a burial ground. I told you that you would think this was some classic cliché, a trope from every damn horror movie out there. But it's actually true, unfortunately. The woods where I saw, heard and smelled something pure evil, was literally what I believe an ancient Native American burial ground. Digging into the stories around sightings like this, I don't think it could have been a Wendigo, thank God, as I wouldn't be here to tell you my story. So my other best guess is that it had to have been a skinwalker, or some other miscellaneous demonic entity. Listen, after that, we never played in those woods again, especially after dark, and if it really was what I think it is, I was very lucky to get away with a permanent Halloween hairstyle and nothing else. Anyway, I'll cut my story short. Thank you so much for listening.